Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Dryden Peterson. I've chosen to live in many places over the course of my life so far, in Uganda, in South Africa, in France, in Botswana, in Boston. And the place I call home is Toronto, where I grew up. <laughs> Always trust the Canadians to cheer. <laughs> Today, I want to talk about learning to change the world by learning about the world, and particularly about the boxes of belonging. I'm going to tell you about a tree, explain a framework, don't worry, it's from a picture book, and then finish with one big idea about education for our collective future. First, I want us to imagine together. I want us to imagine that this big tent that we're under today is a big tree, a Moana tree. Some of you may know it as a baobab tree. I hope that you can see its massive trunk that we're all making up here. And if we all got together and stretched around it, we might, if we joined hands, be able to stretch. Now look up. If we imagine that this tent is the roots of the tree bursting toward the sky, that's what a Moana tree looks like. It looks like its roots are reaching up. It's wondrously bizarre to look at. But most wondrous of all, I find, is the way it survives and thrives in the harshest of desert conditions. I've constantly marveled at these trees. They look as if they're dead. But if only we could see inside, we'd see very differently. This Moana tree draws in whatever water and nutrients are around and turns them against all odds into something solid on which everything in the desert around it depends. For many years, I've worked with girls and boys, with women and men who have lost everything solid around them. There are 26 million refugees today, and more than half of them are children. Refugee, some of the people I work with embrace this word, and some reject it. As with all labels, it depends on how we use it, how it's co-opted and employed to disempower and to exclude. I use the word with the intent to hearken back to this core idea of seeking refuge, of seeking sanctuary, of seeking belonging, like the Moana tree seeking something solid on which all of us collectively can depend. So now the framework. Not a box is a picture book. The author illustrator Antoinette Porti has this cute cartoon rabbit character who starts out sitting in a cardboard box. I've seen children all over the world do this. Any unclaimed cardboard box can become one of the best playthings ever. But the thing is, as this rabbit in the book and all children know, it's not a box. It's a car, it's a robot, it's a rhino hospital. It's so many things. But often, no, says the grown-up, it's a box. The grown-up is bigger and more powerful, and that idea sticks. I wonder how many of you have been in a situation where you've gotten up the courage to speak, you've shared your idea that may well be different from what you've been hearing, and heard back, oh yes, that's so-and-so's idea, the A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z framework. Just as you're thinking, not exactly, it's too late. That label has been slapped, the discussion moves on, and your not-a-box idea gets placed neatly into that box. How many of you have experienced that? Yeah, me too. Many of us have also experienced our ideas or our identities, ourselves, as being outside of any box we've been able to help others imagine. The refugee children and families with whom I work have this experience daily. Their experiences, their lives, the futures they imagine for themselves don't fit neatly into the boxes of nation state borders, into the boxes of schooling, and into the boxes of belonging. They learn about a world, including in schools, in which they don't fit. So now for the big idea. I want to tell you about a woman named Alia and a child named Manar. When Alia fled Syria with her four children, she imagined returning home within a few months. Like most refugees, she left with only one season of clothes, never expecting to be gone for longer. But when we spoke, she had already been in Egypt for three years. The drawings of her daughter, Manar, though, were of a once-upon-a-time life in Syria. 
Alia said that Manar might imagine herself differently if she could go to what she called a good school. The government schools in the area of Cairo where the family could afford rent were of very poor quality, and her mother felt as if Manar were learning very little. The only other school options were problematic as well. At the costly private school Manar initially attended, her teachers were warm and caring, but the other children bullied her to the point where she felt unsafe. And the informal Syrian school, which was free and followed the Syrian curriculum, would keep her connected to a Syrian community, but isolated from Egyptian society and any credentials that she would need to stay in school. Manar was learning only about a world in which she had to weigh not so good options. The United Nations outlines three durable or comprehensive solutions for refugees. The idea is that these solutions represent an end to persecution that led to a refugee's flight. The solutions are resettlement to a distant country like Canada or Norway, return to the country of origin like Manar to Syria, or long-term integration into a host country like Manar in Egypt. But the problem, of course, is that Manar can't predict which of these durable solutions might be durable or even available to her. This uncertainty has implications for determining the criteria for a good school. What kind of education would allow her to bridge her present reality in exile in Egypt with an imagined but uncertain future? Would she return to Syria? If so, the informal Syrian school could provide a safe temporary environment and perhaps ease her transition back to school in Syria. Would she remain in exile in Egypt? If so, following the Egyptian curriculum and obtaining Egyptian certification could help her continue her studies and pursue a livelihood. Creating strong relationships with teachers and kids in Egyptian schools could be worth it, that long-term investment. Would she seek to move on toward Europe? If so, strong skills and certification that could transfer to another context would be key. But the thing is, Manar can't answer these questions. Her choices of schooling place her, place her on a pathway to a certain future, but that future is unknowable. Refugee families, along with policymakers and teachers, struggle daily with the uncertainty of these unknowable futures. But at the same time, they have to make decisions in the present about the curriculum that they will follow, the languages in which they will learn, the kinds of certification that they will receive, and the types of schools that might best prepare them for work and for life, both in the present and the future. The education of refugees, I think, helps us to see just how neatly education has been packaged into boxes labeled nation state. The power of this nation state box approach is like the grown up. It sticks, but it does not always reflect the ways in which refugees seek opportunities. We know that young people growing up today, sitting in cardboard boxes in Kabul or Kingston, Bujumbura or Beirut, imagine and plan for lives that transcend these nation state boxes. For Manar to embed herself in more than one nation state could be a strategy to combat the uncertainty and to leave open multiple possible futures. At the same time, in most countries, refugees cannot access rights that would enable to create these futures. They don't have the right to work or to own property. Education for multiple futures could keep the options open, but no matter what kind of education, these possibilities for Manar will still depend on the restrictions that nation states impose on her. It depends on the boxes. What if our nation states and the education within them were more not a box-like? What would it take to imagine ourselves as a collective, each as part of a larger whole, something solid on which we could all, including Manar, depend? What if we turned our thinking upside down, like the Moana tree appears to do with the roots to the sky? Instead of roots growing down to the past, what if we saw them and cultivated them as growing up, ready to help us make a future that provides something solid for all of us to stand on together. The future of children like Manar, the futures of all children, our collective future, will likely depend on it. I look forward to working on this with all of you together this year. Thank you. Thank you.